Hello, I'm Terry Christensen, and this is Valley Politics, once again in Zoom format. Today we'll talk with Dave Cortese and Ann Ravel, the candidates for state senate in District 15. In a field of seven candidates, Cortese won 34% of the vote in June, followed by Ravel at 22%. So they now face each other in the November runoff. Senate District 15 includes San Jose, Campbell, Cupertino, Saratoga, and Los Gatos. And registered voters in the district are predominantly Democratic. 55% are white, 24% are Asian, 19% are Latino, and 2% are African American. Ravel did best on the west side of the district in June, while Cortese dominated in East San Jose. So we might see a bit of an east side, west side battle in the runoff. We'll ask the candidates about the challenges of campaigning during a pandemic, about education policy and addressing homelessness, and much more, including questions from several voters in the district. And that's what's coming up on Valley Politics. Welcome, everyone, and welcome Ann Ravel and Dave Cortese. First of all, uh, I have to ask what it's like campaigning dur during a pandemic. Uh, Dave, you've did, done this campaign a few times before. What's different about this one? How are you reaching voters when you can't have events and can't go door to door? Yeah, well, that, great question. And you know, as long as I've been campaigning, which goes back to working on other people's campaigns when I was 12 years old, you know, in the, the late 60s, um, you know, door to door and field work and direct interaction, um, with people face to face is, has always been a big part of it. And I think it's particularly true here in San Jose. It's been a tradition of, uh, you know, grassroots activities really been a, a tradition, especially in Democratic Party politics. So, yeah. um, so you miss it um, in, in a lot of the other visibility stuff. You know, I'm just shaking hands with people on uh, the steps of, of the church or whatever. But, um, you know, we've been able to, to reach people. Technology is a, is a wonderful thing. And you know, in my case, um, the first couple of months of shelter in place, of course, I, I just really had to focus on doing my job, and I still do, um, which in and of itself is is different. You know, trying to run a campaign when you when you have a full time position in, in public service is hard anyway, because my day job is sixty five hours a week typically, um, and and that's how it is for most elected officials. But you put COVID on top of that, and you know, the Board of Supervisors, as I understand, on average, has been fielding about 10,000 emails per office per month. So it uh, just gives you an idea. Uh, much like everyone else out there, um, you know, we're on continuous loop, and um, it's, it's a challenge. But I'm having fun with the campaign, so that's the good part. Good. And what about you? I see a lot of you on social media. How's the cam How are you doing with the campaign in right. these circumstances? Well, I, you know, I have to say that I agree with Dave in the sense that um, what I really loved in the primary was yeah. going door to door. And I spent a lot of time in people's living rooms discussing issues. Um, so that kind of inter interaction um, was really important to me because I make decisions by talking to people who are affected. And that would be the entire community, not just special interests. So it was very important. But what I've been doing instead is Zoom events, as you probably know on social media, you've seen it, um, with people who can talk about issues that people care about, which is also something I care about deeply. Um, so I had uh, Joseph Stiglitz, a um, Nobel Prize winning economist, talking about COVID and about how to recover economically from COVID and the problems that we have with income disparity. And I'm lucky to know him personally. Um, he's, he's an endorser and supporter. And I care about the things he talks about because it's why there is economic disparity in this country. And that was the reason. And I had one last night with uh, um, Professor Lessig from Harvard, who, as you may know, is a you know well-known uh, person who has been an activist in the area of voting rights and uh, money and politics. And he too is a strong supporter of mine. 
and because he knows that I'm not going to be beholden to anybody, and he's giving information to the public. Stiglitz had almost 400 people signed up for it who were across the country, but many people locally. And uh, Lessig last night had over 100, maybe 150. And it was um, a good way for people to also ask questions and participate. And that's what I care about. Okay, thank you. And we'll start with you on the next question. Uh, mm -hmm. Recent polling reports that the public thinks shelter in place is being relaxed too quickly in California. Do you think the state's handled the pandemic well so far? And also what role should the state legislature play in decisions about managing the pandemic? Yeah, I think the problems with the way that the state has handled it, and I think it's at the beginning, it was quite clear that people weren't sure about the science and still aren't. And what I really loved about Governor Newsom was he admitted that. He said, look, we're doing what we think is really important to keep people safe. And for that reason, we're doing this. We don't want to take the risk, but we know things can change and we'll change with it. That is a, an elected official who's telling the truth, who's being empathetic to the public. Um, and I think that was a really good thing. I do believe that um, the thinking about opening up um, was maybe uh, not as well thought out, and particularly because different places had different um, rules, and it was confusing for a lot of businesses and the like, and I think that was problematic both from the business side as well as the public side. Um, there needs to be that consistency. But I saw even here in Santa Clara County, there were unbelievable inconsistencies at the beginning, which I think were really bad because it, it loses people's trust in government, which is very important to get them to agree to shelter in place. And for example, they had differential rules for, uh, yes, you could have, um, people doing construction if it was uh, affordable housing, but not if it's market rate housing. Well, that's silly. That's not, a, that's not a health issue. That was a political decision. And I think that those are the kinds of things that make people upset and don't follow the rules, which we need to do. We need to worry both about the health and about both the economy at the same time. Dave, your response? You know, I'm glad to hear that, you know, people by and large, uh, you know, are paying attention, that they, they'd be concerned about opening up too quickly because it tells me that there's buy-in um, and it's something we desperately need to, to hang on to. We need to, to work together against, against this um, disease, COVID-19, that's created by coronavirus and, and nobody's ever done it before. And I, you know, I, as far as the question about the state of California, I think the governor's done a pretty darn good job overall considering a couple of things. One, uh, there hasn't been a governor in modern history who's dealt with anything like this. There was no, uh, there was no operating manual or handbook or, or training ground. It wasn't even an issue that came up during his campaign because how could it? Who would have predicted it? So uh, we're seeing the governor, you know, really operate without without a net on a high wire and he's, he's, he's on, he's on the wire. He's staying there. He's um, made some adjustments. Um, but sometimes I think that's the a good test of a true leader that he's been willing to say, maybe I did move a little too fast. Maybe we did need, we do need to adjust. Maybe we do need to back off a little bit. And I'm not afraid to say that. And I love the fact that he's been exhorting the public uh, to do the right things. He hasn't tried to play it both ways and say, look, I know there's 15% of the people out there uh, who think this is a, a hoax or a non-issue, um, you don't hear him um, really watering down his message. And I, I think that's really, really important right now. You know, and at the local level, we declared uh, a public emergency as a board of supervisors. And the minute you do that, in order to qualify the county for uh, federal uh, reimbursement money, um, it also by statute empowers, in this case, Dr. Sarah Cody, the public health officer, to have 
broad sweeping authority and certainly the Board of Supervisors has uh, called her, you know, in, into public hearings at every possible moment to answer questions and to justify things that she's doing as, as much as we can do so under the law. Um, but, um, you know, I think overall she's done a pretty darn good job too, considering that her primary focus before this event was what we call epidemiology, you know, doing research work on the health of the community. So um, I think the county has a good team in place. Uh, I think the state's got a pretty good team in place. I would like to see more uniformity between the state and all of the counties, especially in the Bay Area. And I think that's something we desperately need right now. Well, it looks like we got a ways to go with this. Um, now here's our first question from one of your voters. This is Patricia Reardon. She's an Evergreen resident and she's a member of the League of Women Voters. Thank you, Terry. Candidates, my question is about homelessness. Recent data indicate that the homeless population in Santa Clara County may exceed 7,000 individuals. Although we regularly look to our cities to provide a solution to this crisis, what are your proposals for how the state of California can contribute to reducing the number of homeless in Santa Clara County? Yeah, so that's a great question. And actually, um, Patricia, the, the numbers are uh, more like 9,700 homeless per the last uh, point in time census. And of that, there's about eight, there were about 8,000 completely unsheltered at the time that census was taken. Since that time, because of some accelerated efforts in um, um, emergency monies that have been brought there under, um, under, under COVID response, about another 700 have been sheltered uh, in motel rooms. But um, it is really the unsheltered and the need for emergency and transitional housing in this county and in counties all over the state uh, that, that needs uh, some backing from the state of California. Here in this county, uh, we've, on the permanent support of housing in terms of building long-term housing, uh, I think we've done more than uh, 57 out of the other 58 counties um, in terms of putting together a $950 million housing bond, 700 million of which is focused only on extremely low income housing for the homeless. But um, what we don't have here, and you don't see it in the state budget either, is, is a huge bucket of money, meaning a, an, an appropriate bucket of money that can be invested in short-term shelter and housing, transitional housing. Uh, and, and that's a problem. And you, it, COVID really laid to bear the fact that that's not available. We don't have places, beds to put people uh, whether they're they're homeless and relatively healthy, or whether they're homeless um, and, and worse yet, uh, addicted or mentally ill, there just aren't beds. There aren't rooms for them, even on a short-term basis here or in most places in the state. So, as a state senator, um, what I want to do is prevail upon uh, Governor Newsom, who has shown indications of wanting to move in that direction, um, and back him up and tell him in the state senate, I'll be a leader, you know, in trying to to create a real program in the state of California for short-term shelter and emergency housing. And what about your policy on, on state aid for homelessness? Thank you. Yeah, I, I think that it's scandalous that our homeless numbers keep going up. And for me, it's a human rights issue and should be taken as one of the most serious questions that we have to deal with. And I know I've had long conversations with Daryl Steinberg, who's running, heading up homeless issues in the state, um, that there is a desire on the part of the governor, as well as um, on himself, to move forward with more permanent housing. I don't think, of course, there should be some tr transitional housing, but we know that the hotel rooms aren't working. That was a big brouhaha, but it didn't happen. Uh, what we really need for people who are homeless is an ability to get training, to get drug treatment, and to be able to be housed so that they can have a sense of security and self-importance and, and be part of the community. So we, as a state senator, I would really push for permanent supportive housing for the homeless. And it, I know that that seems like an unattainable goal because uh, the budget is going to be in shambles after COVID, but we also know that the people who are gonna need that help are gonna be much greater in number than any of the numbers that are tossed around now. There are going to be a lot of people who are homeless. And we have to 
prioritize that because it's not good for the community and it's not good for those people either. Okay, thank you. Now it's time for our lightning round of questions. Please try to limit your answers to a word or two. And we'll go first with you. Do you support or oppose Proposition 15, the reform of 1978's Proposition 13, I, that would increase commercial property taxes? Support or oppose? Uh, I oppose because of the way it's written. Dave? Um, support, in, uh, really that goes back to my history in public education. Okay. One word answers if possible. Uh, Dave, do you support or oppose Proposition 18, the constitutional amendment to remove the voter approved prohibition on affirmative action? It's 16, correct? 16. 16, oh, sorry. 18. I, I do support Prop 18. And Anne? Oh, it's 16, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, my fault. I strongly support 16. I, was, I got my first job under affirmative action. All right, and which current or federal, which current state or federal legislator do you most admire? Uh, well, I know that's a tough one. It, yeah, it, that is a tough one. I um, admire Elizabeth Warren. Elizabeth Warren. Dave? State or federal legislator that yeah. I most admire? I think right now our own. Uh, Representative in Congress, so welcome. Okay, Dave. Which uh, Dave? What's your top choice for a committee assignment if you're elected? I'd love to take my experience here and work on the on the housing committee, housing and infrastructure committee. Okay, and what's your pick? Um, well, there's several. I, I just one. Okay, just one. <laughs> Everybody wants me to be on judiciary so that I can look at the consequences of laws. Okay. Um, and Anne, what's your favorite source of local news? Uh, my favorite source of local news is the San Jose Mercury News. Just because they endorsed you? No, because, <laughs> I, have, um, because uh, I actually <laughs> support them, but I support many others as well. Dave, what's your favorite source? I'd have to say um, NBC Bay Area, but uh, a close second is Janice Rombeck in my own office. <laughs> Janice is great. Uh, Dave, Jerry Brown, or Gavin Newsom? Uh, is there a tie? <laughs> okay, you can say both. <laughs> and what about you, Jerry Brown or Gavin Newsom? Well, you know, uh, I know I'm only supposed to give one word, <laughs> but because uh, Jerry Brown and I talked about policy issues, I have a lot of respect for him, so I go for him. Okay, uh, and for your commute to Sacramento, should you be elected, capital corridor, capital corridor train or car? Train. Dave? EV. Okay, and Dave, number one thing the state can do to address the housing crisis, number one thing in a word or two. Set up uh, a statewide housing finance agency. And? I'd say Jim Bill's bill uh, for uh, tax increment financing. Okay, thank you both. Uh, so we're gonna go back to the one minute answers. Keep them to one minute if you can. And this is another constituent question. This comes from Richard Nguyen. Richard is a Capital Union School District trustee. And he's asking about education funding and the achievement gap. Studies have shown that a child's zip code often determines their educational success. What will you do to ensure that students receive an equitable, 21st century education that allows them to reach their full potential, regardless of their social economic background? Well, the first thing I'll do is fight for something that I've been fighting for, um, along with busloads of people that I bring to Sacramento every year, sometimes 300 at a time, and that's um, equalization of funding among school districts. That's a big problem, uh, and uh, it's, it's represented in those numbers that Richard is looking at. Uh, the other thing is closing additional divide permanently. Uh, just recently, before the recording of this show, I brought to the Board of Supervisors a $7.2 million plan, which the Board approved, that went to the County Office of Education. That money's already appropriated and sent over to the Office of Education to provide uh, Wi-Fi and internet service and tablets and laptops for 15,000 homes where the students don't have that right now. And we're seeing, because of COVID, uh, again, an issue laid bare. It's, it's the, it was a problem before COVID, 
it's a huge problem during COVID that kids are told to do distance learning, but can't hook up. Um, and that's represented in those numbers as well. And? Well, clearly for when students can go back to school, <laughs> Uh, when, when that is. At the moment, what we need to have is statewide uh, broadband, for sure, and I would push for that. Uh, so that's number one. But what is the problem is the differential funding sources for wealthier districts versus others. That's one of the problems. And that definitely should be changed. That funding uh, mechanism should be changed. But also, the money that has been given in the state budget to help lower income students, students who are English learners, students who have other, other disabilities, in many schools throughout the state, they did not use, the school districts did not use that money for the purposes intended. And I would make sure as a state legislator that I would look at our, ex our giving of money and to make sure that it's being used for the purposes that was intended by those of us who voted for it. So I, that is number one as well. And I also think that we know uh, just by, by information th that's been given is that the school districts in the lower income schools often have the less experienced teachers. And that is problematic and the state needs to have some kind of a program that will assure that the teachers are equally distributed, that they are, they are able to have very um, knowledgeable and experienced teachers who can teach in schools where those needs are great. Okay, on a related topic, here's Angelica Cortez. Uh, a District 15 voter and founder of LEAD LEAD Filipino. Here's Angelica. This question relates to ethnic studies. A host of local Senate District 15 student organizations, community-based groups, and nonprofit service providers continue to advocate for the inclusion of ethnic studies in our local schools. However, under state law, ethnic studies remains an elective course. May you share your views on ethnic studies in our public schools? Thank you. I think ethnic studies is extremely important in this state and all throughout the country. Um, it's important for people to understand other people's experience and that's how we are going to have a society that we want where everybody has empathy and understanding of the lives that other people have led. So I support ethnic studies strongly and think that the state should adopt it. Dave? Yeah, uh, thanks for the question, Angelica. And um, I feel like Angelica was on one of those bus trips to Sacramento with us uh, recently uh, to advocate. But uh, yes, let me just say, um, first and foremost, that as a former school board member at Eastside Union for eight years, um, I advocated very directly um, for inclusion of ethnic studies and increasing the curriculum, advancing uh, more opportunity in the curriculum um, to account for the diversity in our school district. For example, uh, UC requirements require a language requirement. That's not ethnic studies per se, uh, but we had a huge Vietnamese population of first and second generation students that weren't allowed when I got there to, uh, to, to take Vietnamese language classes in order to qualify for their UC um, uh, and or Cal State requirements. And, and that changed, we changed that on my initiative. Um, I've worked with uh, the Hindu American Foundation and other ethnic groups to advocate and get state law changed already just as a county supervisor. Um, but what we need to do is open up the ed code. It hasn't been done in at least three decades. There's been a promise to do it in election cycle after election cycle. Uh, it's an archaic set of codes that hasn't been updated to deal with the diversity in the state. It tells the wrong narrative of, of our, our ethnic history and our multicultural history, and that needs to be corrected. And uh, you asked about committees earlier, and I said housing. Another place I'd love to land is on the education committee so I can get uh, directly into the education code and start fixing some of these problems like this that have been festering for decades. Okay, thank you. So I think we're on our final question. We'll have about a minute for each of you on this one. So uh, looking at your websites and looking at your endorsements uh, that you list on the websites, I know Dave's endorsers include 
a lot of labor unions, and yours does not, Anne. So Dave, does this suggest you'll just do whatever your union supporters want? And Anne, does it suggest you won't be worker friendly? Dave, start with you. Yeah, you know, we have um, a wide variety of endorsements. Both candidates in this race have been endorsed by labor unions, not, not just me. And I'm proud of um, not only the labor endorsements, but I got the sole endorsement of the California Democratic Party in this race um, with over 80% of the delegate vote uh, to get that endorsement. So, um, and a unanimous vote at the state convention. So, um, I, I think that, you know, if you look at that endorsement list, my recollection is there's over 160 endorsements, not just labor unions, and they range from former Secretary Normanetta uh, to local school board members of, of, of every ilk, uh, and, and uh, Republicans, Democrats, and so forth. I've enjoyed, uh, in my public service career, which didn't start till I was 45 years old, I came out of a business career, as you know, Terry, uh, to join the city council. Um, and I, I've enjoyed support, as I do in this race, uh, from local uh, chambers of commerce, like the Hispanic Chamber, and also labor unions, business and labor. And it's allowed me, I think, to, to bring people together, uh, to be collaborative, and to find solutions to some of the thorny issues uh, that some of those groups run into. And that's going to be more, than, more important than ever in the state legislature. And what about you, worker-friendly? I, well, let me tell you a little bit about my history. I was a teamster. I worked in the canneries. I still have my Teamster card. I put myself through law school by uh, working as a waitress. And while I was there, I thought we were cheated and I organized all the waitresses uh, in a union. And of course the uh, employer fired us all. Uh, so I took the case to the NLRB. Um, when I was first in the county council's office, I was the president of the county council's union. So I am definitely worker friendly and have been my entire career. I do have um, the carpenters union. The Teamsters gave me money because I am a Teamster in my history. And I care a lot about workers' rights and, and what is best for workers. But I care about what's best for everybody in this state. And actually, my endorsements are the most diverse of any. I have endorsements from Latina's lead because I am a Latina. I have endorsements from Johnny Camus, who was one of my opponents. I have endorsements from Emily's List and Sam Licardo. So my endorsers are of every um, side of the issue, and that's because I work in the public interest and I care about everyone in the community. I listen to everyone in the community. I don't just listen to one group and do what they tell me. Thank I you. listen to the facts. Thank you, Anne Rabble. I'm sorry we're out of time. Okay. Anne Rabble, Dave Cortese. Uh, that's all the time we have today. Thanks very much for being with us on Valley Politics. Good luck with your campaigns. We'll be back next month to continue our election coverage with the runoff candidates for San Jose City Council. Meanwhile, you can follow us on Facebook and you can also catch up on all our previous shows on our website at createvsj.org or on YouTube by searching for Create TV San Jose. And now that's all folks. Thanks for watching.